So, so your correction graph, it was 253 or 259. I did a last minute update last night. It was very last minute because Mama Drock got to the point we set off. Just didn't feel satisfied with where it is. So I quickly found a new stopping point. It's going to happen sometimes. Enjoyment is our first goal. So we're going to, honestly, let me tell you this. Let me tell everybody this. This will make it into the YouTube video. This is the start. I am 100% willing every day of the week to throw professionalism under the bus of fun. Fun is the bus that will demolish all walls. There is no border in this channel that fun will not cross. I, truly, truly, I will sacrifice all of you in the name of fun. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. But that's, <laughs> that's such an insane thing to say, but I'll stick to it. The pedal goes up. I didn't stop at the first one. And then I looked at the second stop and I was like, this is nowhere near where I want to go. And then I called you and said, can I get off later? One of the things that's most important to me is that I just really enjoy the process and I enjoy the story. So we talked about it and decided that for me, I want to make my biggest predictions for arcs like this, where we're dividing them between a couple of things. I want to have all my crazy corkboard corner at the end of the arc so that I can really dive in and use the whole arc to pull apart. Doesn't mean there isn't things already happening here. It just means that the bigger spoilers are always, or the interesting things are always going to come at the end of the arc. But I am loving Skypea. Visually, it is ridiculous. It's one of the most cool looking things. Coming up to Skypea and you think, uh, everything is just going to be hunky dory and they finally got here and you're feeling so happy for them. And then boom, one monster after another, and then immediately they're attacked by um, people wearing absolutely awesome masks. So it was so Oda. He's like, welcome to the sky, and here's some beautiful scenery, and I wonder what's going to... Oh, death. Death is coming. And I was like, thanks, Oda. That feels on brand for you. And this is literally, like, when you go into Skypea, it's everything you're hoping for right away. Like... You you come in there, the clouds are all around, you're sailing on top of the clouds, they do these great, beautiful, I love when he does that thing where he pulls out and lets you have a two-page spread of like a phenomenal scene. And in this one, you pull back and we just see the Mary sailing along on top of the clouds, but then there's clouds that go up and create mountains and you're just like, yeah. We start right away when Usopp decides to go for a swim, which is pretty brave when yeah. you consider that you're on top of clouds. So good, brave moment for Usopp. And yeah. then um, immediately starts to sink. And then when Luffy goes to reach for him again, putting Robin, putting her eyes all over his arm and hand. Come on. Genius. Ojo Fleur. Phenomenal moment. And it stops right at the top. I've already just said moment. How many times have I said it already? I think so far you've said it like two or three times. Star says 10. Uh, then the amazing octopus whose tentacles actually have snakes at the end somewhere, it seems. And then they're like, we fight this, no problem. Then boom, we have actual human beings saying, I'm going to get rid of you coming in here, flying in on wicked, wicked, what turns out to be those shoes. P.S. Why don't I own those already? It's tragic, isn't it? It is tragic. I feel really ripped off now. I didn't know I was missing them. And then we meet... The Sky Knight, who I think Nami ends up calling the weird knight dude at some point and turns out to be first Kami. And Sky yeah. Knight is everything you hope he is. And his his companion, I mean, it's going to be hard for you to guess this, but I really liked his companion. Wait, are you saying you like Pierre, the animal, the One Piece animal <laughs> Pierre is a character you like? Yeah, there's something I'm about him. Shocked. I'm shocked. But yeah, there are a lot of people in the community who straight up say you should skip Skypea, and I strongly disagree. Oh my god, but... no. But yeah. for me, I mean, you told me that you had some trouble with it because of the um, fight scene being so terrible, and... God, the fucking ball guy takes forever, the anime. <laughs> yeah, fucking and you guy. were like, I hate that guy so much. I hate that the whole scene so much, which I thought was kind of awesome. Okay, not to skip too far ahead, but let's just deal with this ball guy straight in his we're, face. We're, we're, not go we're going back to classic Mom Piece episode one where we're just kind of jumping around because we need to dish on ball guy. <laughs> okay, so I just want to talk about ball guy for a minute. Because when you are watching ball guy, 
um, I hear that he is the worst. But when you're reading Ball Guy, you go through kind of an arc where you start in the beginning with classic Luffy when he jumps in and does things before he's even had any thought about it and doesn't let himself um, have some consideration, make a plan, et cetera, et cetera. He's just like, jump in, kill, attack. And then as you're watching it, they start to become more strategic. And it's almost like you re-get to see them reenact their entire learning curve they've had now while they're fighting Satori. In the manga, I think it's the best henchman fight in Skypea. But I also think Skypea does have some of the weakest henchmen, personality-wise. That being said, the manga doesn't make you sit through like five fucking episodes of that guy's stupid giggle. <laughs> sometimes One Piece laughs are great, and sometimes... Hearing them for too long kills your heart. I don't know anyone's voice, so I make them up. Mm. The ones in my head are dynamic. and uh, But I got to tell you, I also, like, it'll just say that they laughed. It'll be like, ha, 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 or whatever it is. And so... Yeah, you're, the the translators at Viz still aren't adding in the classic One Piece laugh where the no, laughs have defined like, characteristics. I didn't know that Blackbeard was a Zay, ha, 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 which would which is so be good. cool. Or that uh, Luffy at first, until I got to see the other thing, was she, 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 which changed the way that I saw the D for Luffy D for Monkey Lee D. Monkey <laughs> D Luffy. <laughs> Well, normally I keep our flubs out, but you, you can't blame me if I keep that one in, right? You know what? I want it in. People should know. <laughs> <laughs> Monkey Doofy. Monkey Doofy. <laughs> <laughs> Moving into another thing, when we first get to Heaven's Gate, that's another one of those, he gives you what you're hoping for. You've got yourself a great big star and an arch and you can sail under it and it goes heaven's gate and then there's a great big cloud that goes straight up out of it and it's ominous and then who do you run into amazon heaven gate inspector and i just adore that it's an inspector the idea that they're like let me see what's on your ship why are you up here <laughs> fantastic <laughs> Oh what do you got God. there? Let me take a picture of you so I can send this out to everybody. She's a TSA yeah. worker. The first thing that's you meet when you get to heaven is a TSA worker. Exactly. That's the exact right metaphor. And then she's like, hey, <laughs> let me see what you're doing. And he takes shit away. That's phenomenal. And so having this person exactly a bureaucracy in the middle of a fantasy such a reality moment where you're you've bounced on clouds you've had weird monsters come out of them yeah. you've hugged the clouds you go through a gate and then boom bureaucracy is like well, can i see your passport someone's pointing out a retired god sky knight on a pegasus has also shown up at this point like yeah. you've been exposed to fantasy heaven other world sky world yeah. and then yeah. you get and through then... it and the fucking tsa meets you at a border checkpoint Exactly. It's perfect. <laughs> she's just as evil as you might think all your TSA people actually are, because then she's <laughs> like, sure, you can go through. Go ahead and go through. I'm going to take away your ability to have a good life from now on. I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen when you don't pay the fee. I'm just going to tell you that, yeah, if you can't pay, you can still go if you want. And then she makes that face. Boom. Up goes the Mary. And she just sits there and smirks and then says, render heavenly judgment. Says it to them. Seven people have illegally entered Godland, Skypea. Render heavenly judgment. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's love so, it. Love, yeah. love this for the crew. It's You pop out Skypea, Land of the Gods, and the White White Sea. And I'm always here for a good um, double-upped word, so White White works. And then this double page... And again, everything you would hope for. Beautiful, beautiful trees, fluffy sky plateaus, castles, little houses. It's magic. It's absolutely what everyone thinks that a heaven would look like. First introductory over those first few pages. I can't imagine anyone reading this and not making a little sound like, oh, <laughs> that's so everything you hope just absolutely soaked in adventure. I mean, it's it's perfect. It is a perfect opening to Skypea. And it made me just sit back and be like, oh my God, we are not in Kansas anymore. And I'm so stoked about it. It felt like going to the world of Oz. 
they meet the good good angel on the beach who's just playing her music and hanging out and says hesso hesso means belly button in japanese how did i not look that up oh my god hesso huh Mm. I thought it was just like a fun translation of hello. And in the Japanese, they were saying like Konichi Wu or something and they needed a way to like, uh, okay, that's funny. Oh God, that's amazing. Here is more evidence that Nami is magical and powerful. So we've got the wave riders and Luffy goes on them and immediately sucks. And then they talk about how you usually need at least 10 years of super concentrated focus time to learn out how to ride them. And instead, Nami jumps on these biatches, boom, drives away and rocks it out very first time she's on them. And I'm telling you 100%, this is more evidence that Nami is actually magical. All right. Okay, dials. That's a fun ass system. I need to say dials are one of my favorite fantasy concepts in, in media. I think they're fantastic and... When I was going through the sluggishly paced anime, I was like, these guys make it worthwhile. I love them so much. Dials are great. Yeah. I think I want to create a new list of the different types of technologies and pieces that are made in here because I haven't been keeping track of them. Things like log pose and dial, et cetera, et cetera. Because I think so far dials are one of my very, very favorite things. Like what a cool concept. The idea of because it's almost like a reciprocal energy concept that you store mm. and then receive back. And I think that's wicked. They remind me of, uh, hey, deep cut for fantasy. F- hey, you guys, wait, somebody of you are Murph watchers. If you're, if anyone's likely to know about this, it's you. They remind me of Furikemi from uh, Mistborn, which is one of my favorite magic systems yes. ever. It's a phenomenal system. And P.S. Jaunty, I know that you dropped it in book two. I just got to tell you. Give mm-hmm. yourself a little boost and read it. Mistborn number three, the ending is one of the best endings ever written in fiction. It's, I was shocked uh, at how good it was. It was really interesting that we got to love these couple of people because oh, it's yeah. great that we got to see them as this normal family and they immediately accept him. And you could feel what Skypea would have been like if you go back into this afterwards and start thinking about the way that they fed them and cared for them and took care of their wave rider and did all these things. And then later when they come out to their rescue and they put themselves on the line for them, you can feel what it was like in Skypea prior to having somebody in who was a new God who demanded a different type of respect through uh, monetary means because this family is delightful. These two people are amazing. And yet she feels all this pressure and sadness. And you can see starting in Skypea, there's a place that you must never go. She starts sweating there and then continues to sweat throughout. I am a little worried about her character. I swear to God, if she dies, I'm going to be so upset. To be fair, who's died so far? Yeah, I don't trust that. When nobody has died, they're saving a death to break you. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way they're not. And... I'm concerned because I don't want to be mean to Connus, but I kind of want to kill her over who I think might die. Yeah, because you, you do have a forbidden theory about what you think might happen in the future. Oh, so are, are I you thinking think about it. Are you thinking you can throw Connus under the fun bus and we won't have to deal with your forbidden prediction? I don't want to be mean, but I'm hoping we could throw Connus under the bus so we can let the other one live who I think is going <laughs> to die. So you've got this big, huge thing called the upper yard in the domain of Kami with these giant ass trees. Once again, his perspective drawing is ridiculous because Nami is this just like speck of dirt on the bottom, on the on the top of the clouds with these enormous trees overhead. They tell Luffy all about the forbidden place that he cannot go, blah, blah, blah. Zoro and Sanji and Usopp in their head all think the same things and say, yeah, he's going to go there. He's going to go there. They all know immediately when she's like, whatever you do, you can't go to this area. And Luffy is like, no, no, absolutely not. But yeah, let's go. I really enjoy the time where Nami all of a sudden realizes what's happened, realizes that the your TSA officer had said, you'll have to pay the entrance fee of 1 billion extols per person and understands that because they didn't pay the fee that they were now in deep, deep trouble. The whole White Beret Battalion come up the beach like sneaky sneakers in, 
crawling through the jungle, but they're just out in public and everyone can see them. Just an excellent choice, I guess. Um, which leads us to them having to run away and realizing that they were in big, big trouble and would have to pay so much more money and takes us eventually into Connus bringing them to her boat and helping them to escape and then admitting that she had turned them in and called the police. And you could see her sweating. And I loved it because you think that that would be kind of the end of a friendship, but then you wouldn't know Luffy because rather than when she says, we're not allowed to do this and now this and this would happen. And then they look at her and rather than getting upset, they're like, so you weren't supposed to tell us and you did. And she's like, yeah, I had to let you know because you're in so much trouble and they all scratch your heads. And then they're, and she's like, I'm so sorry. I, I called them and they're like, and now why did you just tell us that now you're in trouble in a total straw hat moment, rather than getting all pissed off that she turned them in, they get all pissed off that she put herself in danger. And I was just like, Oh, I'm so proud of you guys right now. I just want to high five you. But when they get on her boat, you know what Luffy's saying? I think this boat is so cool. Pro boat. I'm going to call it Raven. It's a Raven boat now. Okay. That's perfect for this to be Raven because this story from now on up until this moment, you're like, oh, we're in the sky and it's about this and it's about this. And then from this moment on, you're like, oh, and also um, colonization. <laughs> this is a story about colonialism, <laughs> motherfucker. It's perfect that we're in a Raven boat because Raven has such a huge place inside of any creation stories or any stories in indigenous narrative. So yeah, it couldn't and, be more perfect. And our good friends, the Shandians, draw from Mesoamerican inspiration. And uh, you uh, think so when part of their name is basically Indian? Fair. And the Raven <laughs> tends to be in uh, Mesoamerican mythology, a lot of them, uh, which is another animist mythology. The Raven tends to be the go between. Uh, between the layer of the divine and the layer of the animal. Perfectly. Exactly. So Raven is in the heavenscape and they're riding on Raven, who's taking them deeper towards the deities. It's so perfect as a vehicle to take them deeper towards the deities. And then we get there. Then they have to choose how they want to do their challenge. Challenge of the ball, challenge of the string, challenge of the iron, or challenge of the swamp. And they chose ball. I knew they would. It. I would have chose string. This area here is amazing because there's a sacrificial plinth. When you come to the sacrificial plinth and we're sitting here, it's interesting that that's where it leads to, given that this these old remnants are clearly from the Shandians and not the deities that we're dealing with. But the new deities have decided to use this as the area that you would have to sacrifice for. Don't you think that's interesting? Definitely making a statement about colonialism. I mean, they, exactly. they are in general with the idea of things that are sacred being taken for new purposes. They're saying, you don't understand how things like this sacrificial altar are so important. And this is something where we do our, our great ceremonies and we make you sacrifice yourself to our God. And the Shandians are like, you freaking kidding me? That's our society. Yeah. <laughs> where do you get off co-opting it as your own <laughs> sacred place? So now we're into the fight you despise. Well, okay. I actually do really like it in the manga. This is where we started today's stream was with this. I like it in the manga. It's so <laughs> irritating in the anime. It's a great fight. I mean, it's not too long. Satori has the whole thing. Like I said, it shows us the arc of how the Straw Hat started to where they are right now. I love kind of the surprise idea of when a ball hits you, you don't know what you're going to get. It could be nothing. I thought that it was absolutely fantastic because it's more a type of torture rather than a type of punishment with so much inconsistency. So the boat's out there and each one of the people in the fight, Sanji and Usopp and Luffy, all had to play into their strengths in order to make sure that they would get on the boat, they would fight. So they worked in a kind of a unison like I hadn't seen these three work before together. And it was really beautifully done. Usopp doesn't really hesitate here. Like, is he afraid? Yeah, but... It's there's so much less hesitation. He uses his. Oh, God, I'm sorry. I'm just in case you want a delightfully awful picture on page 14 of 20 in chapter 247. Usopp does 
compress the side of his hips and is standing backwards. And then a giant snake rope shoots out from his middle section that does look a little <laughs> fat, like I'm not going to lie to you. And then Sanji takes them both, both aside when they both come back with beat up faces and said, all right, look, let's just forget this little incident. Are you two through monkeying around? Yes, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. And then he's like, we need, the three of us need to work together. Forget the ship for a minute. Right now, the three of us need to work together. And then we got to see all of um, the growth of the Straw Hats together, the way that we've seen it in the other arcs combined in this one fight with Sanji, Luffy, and Usopp. We got to see them from their beginnings of how they acted and running into things without thought. And then the slow, gradual change of Usopp into somebody who is hesitant but braver um, all the way to the end when they're working together in harmony and creating the balance that they need to have victory. And I just think that was beautiful. I think Kaido might be right that I kind of need to call this one. I've been refining it for a long time, but I think it might be done. (laughs) I think I might need a second drawing. Well, you know I have ideas. Uh, you do, but I don't know if I have time to do your ideas here. Let's get the, let's get the, why don't you draw me in the submarine the way that we wanted to? Okay. Mantra. Should we talk about it now? Or should we talk about it near the end? Because a little uh, ball, dumb ball guy uses it, right? Dumb ball guy. Dumb ball guy uses mantra. The the ball man, the man who's a ball. The person I think is called Asta. A-I-S-A. And she seems to just have it naturally. the, The little kid. Like she was born with it and she can't turn it off. It's in her world all the time. We talked about this earlier. No, we're not allowed to talk about it because we're supposed to be talking about the... (laughs) Okay. We're supposed to be talking about Manta. Mantra. Yeah, so I'm wondering. I think that it feels like Mantra is almost a type of devil fruit given thing. I was trying to figure out if the other um, people in... Multiple people have this same power. Yeah, and that's the thing is that... It kind of feels like that, except for the thing that makes it different is that everyone can get this type of power. So it feels like it's not natural. It's something you do to get it or it's given to you by someone specifically. And yet here we are with the Shandian Asa and and her natural born gift of Mont. And I'm not near I'm not near the end. I have 30 more chapters, I think. But it feels like it's something that they took or were given or or found because it feels like this power is in them isn't a natural power. It isn't something that they have. It feels like it's something that they stole almost. So for now, I'm going to say it feels like something that was stolen by these ones, stolen by the god and gifted to some of them. All right. Mm. right. I don't know. But yeah, that's going to be my pedal goes up for now. Um, I think that Eminem slash God is one of the cooler baddies I've ever seen. I do not love his henchmen as much. I think that they are just. Uh, They're serviceable. Yeah. It is the best I can give them. There is the dumb guy in here whose name is Gadatsu. And Gadatsu actually translates as a couple of things. The one that it mostly translates as is having enlightenment. And then they talk about how this type of enlightenment is the ability to look with inside yourself to find balance and peace and become enlightened. And so I love the bit where they have him with his eyeballs rolled back inside of his head because it's him looking deep inside of himself for enlightenment. It's kind of an awesome joke. Finding the other half of Cricket's house up there and understanding what it looks like that they pulled an entire section of earth up into the sky and that it isn't missing. Jaya isn't missing in the sense that something has sunk and the ocean is taking it over as any rational person would assume. I mean, any rational person except for Oda, it has been taken, moved up above. So it always existed. Nolan's stories were always true. And the other half of the house, I love that they take what we had in Jaya with getting to see half of Cricket's house and then boom, we go into Skypea and there's the other half. That was pretty cool. I was like, thank you for laying down those sweet, sweet pieces of breadcrumbs. We've picked them up. We're so happy. Oh, the wolf party I do want to do. The thing that made Mm -hmm. that really cool is that uh, you also have first Kami God sitting there and you have 
all the people who are sitting around the outside for whom a party is more fun in the watching than it is in the dancing and who just get to be rested and relaxed in it. And I, every time it happens, I have to say it again. I'm so grateful that Oda gives you those times when things are at peace and you just get to enjoy your characters having a nice relaxed time in the middle of all of this, in the middle of all this craziness, fights and battles and colonization and trying to figure out this mystery and looking for the gold and everything else, you have a stop and you make a big fire. And it becomes a joke where Luffy is like, they're like, you can't make a big fire. You're going to attract a, um, dangerous animals. And we're in the middle of here. And, da, 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 da. and they're like, no, you don't know how to camp. You have to have a big fire. That's rule number one. And then and then you turn around and uh, Sanji has made an even bigger fire. And he says, yeah, uh, is this good, Luffy? And then they have this absolutely enormous bonfire. And then when you see all the eyes coming out from behind, rather than the things that come out being another fight and another thing they're going to have to conquer and Luffy and Sanji being proven wrong, instead of that, the wolves come out and dance with them. Now we are the wild things. And it's exactly what you were talking about with that Japanese idea of you might be in the most hellacious moments of your life, but there's still an opportunity to find some delight within the midst if you just let yourself. And I think that's how he keeps taking something that has such serious themes and that really delves into some stuff that I don't think a lot of traditional quote unquote comics would do. And he says, you're going to have to conquer and and go through a lot of very heavy material, but we're also just going to be goofs. That is what makes me feel so happy when I saw that picture. And I was just really filled with gratitude for him creating that little encapsulated scene for all of the characters because when you go into the fighting game afterwards it's just like death after death with m m sitting at the top being like oh another's gone oh now we're down to this many we started with this many but we're gonna get down to five and you're like oh my god <laughs> I'm exhausted. most people's mantra seems to be able to like track the movements and and aggressions and attack of like their opponent and that's it kind of like to an extent and this fucker is tracking how many people are alive in all of the upper yard they do make you suspicious of who you think might have been the person to fix the mary because the person knew what it looked like before took things off of it that would have been there so that does make you question like okay who was this and how did they know what it looked like before? Who is up there that's young enough but knows what it looks like before that might have known? Could it be the... I mean, it, it can't be the... Uh, who the hell? Who the hell is this little person who fixed it? Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> um, I'm in love with this snake. And I'm not a big snake fan in general, but I'm in love with this snake. This snake is is... Thick ass. The snake whose name has been spoiled for you as Nola. I don't give a crap. I'm glad it was spoiled. I hated calling it the snake. So its <laughs> name is Nola because you it deserves a name. Big snake. No. Nola. So um, even though Nola has strange, strange hair coming off of the bottom of her, I really love Nola. And there's a moment where we see her crying near the end, which absolutely crushes me. I was a little surprised that Luffy didn't know he had been eaten by the snack. I immediately was like, you're inside the snack, Luffy. And Luffy was like, what? I also enjoy that they have the first um, Kamani having the fight with Wiper and the group saying like, yeah, you're no better. Do you think we give a crap who's at the top? Like you seem to think you're some benevolent leader, but top is top. And we're uninterested. I think that was pretty awesome you're still acting as if our sacred land is somehow more important to you than it is to us with wiper was absolutely so cool oh what a great fight and i loved seeing their strengths matched up against each other but more than that i love luffy being eaten by a snake yeah and i like that he was forced into this fight but I like that he treated it seriously. There's kind of that mm. honor thing going on that was very similar to when we were in Little Garden, that if somebody yeah. is going to take you to a fight, and you can see it over and over again, whenever they apologize, like, I'm really sorry for not taking you as seriously. Now I'm going to up my serious level, and then you're going to die. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> before I kill you, before I intend to kill you, I'm going to apologize for not taking you seriously enough and bringing my full skills to this table. I love how they keep doing the little joke with Chopper, where Chopper can go through enemies and enemies don't know that it's... Um, that Chopper is a member of the crew. He just looks like a reindeer wearing a hat. And they're like, I don't even notice. And then somebody is like, no, no, that, that reindeer is part of the crew. Then again, it is the dude who looks deep, deep inside so that he can get enlightenment and can't even see what's in front of his face. And also earlier, he bites his lip and tries talking. And then one of his comrades is like, you know, we can understand you and you bite your lip and talk to us. Chopper comes up and grabs his shoe off. That was great. That felt like an Usopp growth moment, right? Like, you only have what you have, so what are you going to do to take him down? Well, I have to take a shoe. i That's the only way. Those shoes are giving him too much, str- too much strength. And then Chopper screaming, I am a monster! I am strong! Jet punch! Cloven! Okay. I'm not going to pull all of Chopper's fight apart to talk about, but... Cloven cross, and then you have a full two page spread. Muscles rippling on Chopper, and his two hooves facing out to make a perfect cross. Boom! It's right a cool into attack. the face. Oh, that's a great attack. At the end of his fight, when you have dude's face buried deep into the clouds before he falls all the way through, that Chopper screams out, At last! Now I'm a real pirate! Aww. Oh, right, because he didn't get a 1v1 before this. I forgot that. Nope, that's his 1v1. He had fought with Usopp before. Kind and of he wild had... to think that Usopp was like a mentor for him being a pirate by helping him in his first battle. But it's appropriate, because when you're watching Chopper's growth as a straw hat, he had a really similar growth pattern as Usopp. Eminem sits his ass up in a tree, and he tells okay. the Shandians, come on up, he won't move, and they can fight him. Meanwhile, you have poor, poor Nami fighting on the boat with the weird first god, using her weapon that she got from Usopp, which she's actually learning to use quite well. She didn't say, wait a minute while I attack you. I just have to get <laughs> things together this time. And let's be honest, for Nami, that's a big moment. That's some growth. I hope Usopp helps to bump her up and give Is her... Is this a uh, hope or a predict? I'll predict it. I think Usopp is going to. I don't know if he'll perfect that weapon. He can do whatever he wants to that weapon. That is not in my prediction. So we'll count either. We'll count either this weapon being improved okay. or she gets a new one. I really like to see the father and daughter come back with Asa and Asa saying, I've never been so afraid in my life. There are so many voices. So many voices are fading away. That's a phenomenal way to do that rather than making us realize how many people have died and what that means and how upsetting it is. Doing it through the eyes of a child who can hear all those voices in her mantra and then having the voices just go, and out. We are at Eminem. He's standing in on the front. He takes somebody down. He puts out full boats. Run, wiper, run. Wiper, I'm getting killed here. Reject. The reject dial has no effect on him. You think you're faster than lightning? Run, wiper. One million vote. Vari. Whoosh. Out goes all the electricity. Eminem stands there all powerful and godlike with electricity floating all over his body. I'm assuming it is because it's not in color. The electricity has reached the Milky Road. What a pity. The discharge silenced 20 voices. The fools. And because of the thing that Oda did earlier, now I know that Asa is sitting on a boat and probably screamed in that moment. Love the South Birds being giant. Love the South Birds making fun of Zoro because Zoro's too serious. I, I also love that Zoro's sense of direction is bad enough that with birds known to point south, this man can't keep a straight line. Yeah, exactly. You're like, dude, you, you are with a giant frickin' south bird. You still can't go in the right direction. There are, what the there hell, are man? living compasses following you. <laughs> and not even a small one. It's not like you're trying to keep track of this tiny little object. A, a giant living compass is stalking you city of lost gold in the middle of the jungle like it it's exactly it, once again oda giving what the people would want to see he's really gotten quite good at building up the tension this last fight was pure delight this is everyone oh, this at the end of the fight 
you first had like you have Wiper, you have Zorro, you have Old God, New God's not here. You have a bunch of the people from the Shandians here. You have uh, Nora, you have um, the puppy. What's the puppy's name again? Ruby? Oh, holy. You have you have everything here. The end of this fight with our Zoro, when he says, but I've already set my target and your companions have done well on your heart. Pray to the Kami, swords, man of the blue sea, idiot. I will never pray to the Kami. Pity well, do as you like. And then boom, he goes three sword dial, 108 pound Phoenix. He deflected an iron cloud. Kachoom! Zoro gives the 108 pound phoenix like a full freaking hero. And shocks reverberate. His weapon is decimated and he flies backwards. And you're like, oh, looks like you're not alive anymore, Iron Man. Zoro always feels so wild to quantify because everyone has insane powers. And you're like, how does Zoro stack up? And it's just, what does Zoro bring to the table? Well, He's very, very strong. Yeah. And he's very, very tough. Yeah. And that's it. That's it. That's the list. That's the list of powers. <laughs> he's got swords. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about some cork board. Before that, do you want to do a plug real quick? Oh, for, for to be subbed? Is it Actually, with this thing? You know what? You know what? Before you do the plug, I want to add something in here that's okay. added, that added a little bit of a plug. Hey, everybody. When this first started, uh, episode one, when it was first popping off before the channel had grown even to a thousand subs, someone commented something that felt insane at the time because it was way too early uh, that I agreed to because it's funny and I'm sticking to it, which is there's a character down the road in one piece you know him i know him who has the same haircut that i do and someone was like hey if you reach fifty thousand subs as a celebration you should dye your hair like said character so i'm going to add something to it which is the arc where that character is significant for the first time we're a ways off if we hit fifty thousand subs before then i will bleach my hair and like go out of my way to get a shirt to do closet cosplay of that character for that arc. So if you want me to dress up as the character with my haircut, uh, make sure you sub because I am obliged to do it because someone suggested that I do it as a 50K thing way far ago. Uh, it is Pineapple Head. I feel like that's not a spoiler to say. Okay. Um, am I doing this sub now? You're am I in the sub? sub? Is You're this in the me? Sub -sub. This is is, you in the am sub -sub. I in there? Is You're that my there? little unicorn head there? Everybody counter it. <laughs> <laughs> Count me in. The tradition. Counter in, chat. <laughs> Have you been enjoying the content that we've had on the Drock show and been enjoying hearing me, Mama Drock, read One Piece and have a good time with it for the last little while? Me too. I've enjoyed it tremendously. I have two things I'd like to say. Number one, why don't you come and follow us on Twitch? and have a good time in the chat. And you may have an opportunity to see me read a chapter live like the good fellows here just did. Also, why don't you press subscribe right now and ring the bell so that you don't miss out on anything that happens. And if you liked it, like it. If you're still here, I'm assuming you liked it. I often see things and forget to do the like and subscribe, but we would like to see you more often. Also, that's me. I'm inside that sub. Did you notice? It's tuna sub. It's a sub sub. <laughs> beautiful <laughs> wonderful Everyone's wait. i love when chat waves to youtube on a stream i find it so pleasant and fun we head into the cork board yeah, yeah. cork board isn't super long because like i said we want to do a large cork board at the end of the arc so that i have the whole perspective but first of all i want to talk about robin so i had some trouble with robin last round and and we know last round i was like come on robin this time around, I think Robin was amazing. She brought the thing. So first she realizes that there's an issue. She's in the midst of trying to find the lost city. Not for the same reasons as everybody else who's trying to find the lost city. And she realizes that there is writing on one of the stone plinths that is talking about something that we all know and hate, 
the Pluton. Pluton is also another name of the god Hades, or Greek for the unseen. So when she realizes that it has the same writing on it, she thinks that it's possibility that this area actually might have information about a thing that I just found out about, about a lost hundred years. And I said last time that I wasn't sure how much I trusted Robin because it felt like every time she went somewhere, she was looking for something and that she had an agenda that was beyond what the agenda of the Straw Hats was. And then when she found this and she got into her first fight and she was talking about how this person is ruining something that they actually can't comprehend, it made me realize that she absolutely did have an agenda and that she is trying to find out about this void century. When I heard that, I realized that I believe that the government is hiding stuff. We know that they are trying to keep secrets and put things together. Now I know what the government is trying to hide. They're trying to hide information from this void century which is going to somehow be a thing that could possibly destabilize the three pillars. We already talked about last time that I believe the three pillars are the seven warlords, the center area with the deities, and then the outside is the government, which could be as long as we want. We were talking about that. So mm -hmm. whatever happened to the world before, and the reason they're trying to protect it so hard, is probably what occurred within this void century. Then I connected that, in my opinion, the three different phrases that are the most connected, and, and I think they all lead to the one piece in the end, so I'm kind of starting to lead myself towards the one piece, are these phrases. The world is waiting for our answer. And then the next one that's connected to it is, the destruction of the three great powers would reverberate throughout the world. They must be protected. So that one is attached to the first one. and then. Perhaps this island holds the secret of the unspoken history that the land below has ceased to talk about. So these three ideas with these three sentences, I'm using these three sentences as placeholders for these ideas that I'm connecting together. And um, I'm going to give them each a question corner where I make questions for all of them. I just already had some in place for the world is waiting for our answer. And then I was like, it's interesting that. Like, we know Noland was right, and we know that there was gold. But And then they said, you know, it's possible that the knock-up knocked up this part of Jaya where the thing was because the knock-up existed. And I was like, mm, no, that's way too neat of an answer. What makes more sense for me, and in Corkboard Crazy Corner, I'm thinking, is that it was intentional. So they intentionally guide a part of Jaya because Noland was right and the answer to the void century was inside of this part of Jaya with this society that had been pulled apart and so it was intentional and that perhaps the knock-up was created to lift this part of Jaya into the sky. So they intentionally created something or someone or some ones had enough power to create something that would lift part of Jaya because obliterating it would be too obvious. If a whole thing just disappeared, people would know that. Um, sinking it, people are going to look for it. If you just kill off a whole bunch of people, people are going to ask questions. But if it, if it disappears and you can't find it underneath and you can't find any remnants of it because it's now above you, hidden away, then that would make way more sense if you were trying to hide the information. I think because Nolan talked about it, talked about the gold, more importantly, talked about the bell. So when Nolan talked about the bell, they were like, we have to move this up because they were saying like that bell, in my opinion, is something that when rang might be something that's connected to the Pluton. And if it's rang, it will lift or release the boulder that's in front of the underworld. And that's why it would be called something like Pluton, which is connected to Hades or the unseen. And so if that happened, um, then it would allow, in my opinion, the one that I call is is an Ami, the first God, but the one who's down underneath to come out because I was questioning, like, why would you want to hide this stuff from the world? But if you were trying to hide a way to keep Izunami underground, then maybe that's one of the reasons that you would do that is because 
if these bells are found, these giant golden bells, I believe are going to be one of the keys to how to open up the underworld and let them out. That would destabilize the pillars. Then the other thing that I was thinking about is why seven? So why seven warlords? So I started to look at the Japanese thing, and I think a lot of people know that there is seven gods of luck in Japan. And when you start to look at them, there are some similarities in these seven gods. Bishimon would be Hawkeye. It's a warrior god who kind of wears an armor suit and carries a giant sword. Ibis is a fisherman or sea god. He has a fishing pole. He carries a sea brim under his arm. And that would be, what is the name of him? Jim? No. Uh, Jim Jim? Jimbe. That would be Jimbe, and he's about honesty, so he would be telling the truth about race and racism. And so then when I started to go through it, I realized that it's possible that the idea of the seven warlords could come from the seven good luck gods. In that case, you would need to have all seven of them in place because they would be a luck circle. I think that that would be something that would make perfect sense. Yeah. So then I wrote down here that one of the warlords has to be a woman in that case, because the last one on here will be a woman. It's a god of music. She carries around a mandolin. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect when you're doing these types of things, when you're kind of borrowing ideas from mythos and you're using these types of pieces. I don't think that it's an exact, but I do think that he definitely will have um, a woman as one of the warlords. So that's in my opinion, 100%. Yeah, let me just say, I have to change my order now. Yeah, what's the number one devil fruit, I wonder? Mm, Let me think. Yeah, it's the lightning. Uh, You think it's control, become, and turn into possibly one of the most, one of the most powerful forces in nature? Uh, Like, not even a question. Lightning, lightning me all day long. Yeah, It makes sense that this guy would go down as God. Now, I need to remind you of something you said real quick. What? A devil fruit can't make someone a god. I still don't think he's a god. I'm just saying, man's title, man's name is God. It's God Eneru. Uh, no, he, you can, I can call myself God Mama Drock. You could. I'm not gonna, All because I'm, saying I'm not devil crazy. fruit made this man a god. Fear is the kami. So if that's your number one, is number two still Robin? The yeah, especially economy. after this time, like watching Robin use her arms to climb down and the eyeballs all over the hands and the hands twisting in two directions to snap a neck like all day. Robin's is still mm-hmm. number two. Uh, number three was number two Luffy before. I can't remember. What's your number three? What are you feeling? Let's go vibes. It's still, three is still Luffy today. OK. OK. And then number four is going to be smoke. Okay, smoke is pretty good. And number five is still going to be slip slip because I have a thing about not wanting to be hit by weapons. Fair. Now, I want to check in with you on something. You said, how do you even beat lightning because you stab it and you just get shocked? How do you think they deal with this motherfucker? Yeah, I had a big think about this a minute ago. So I was like, what is a non-conductor? I thought about this with Luffy before when they were all like, this is a conductor and da 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 and I will just kill you when you stab. I was like, well, Luffy will be pretty good unless he melts. But I think Luffy is his weakness. The problem will be, well, there's some good things too because Luffy's stupider. <laughs> well, because if you're using Mantra, but you have somebody who is chaos... You know, there's this way that Luffy's ability to hide his thoughts and walk through the woods without thinking things makes him potentially the greatest weapon against him because you've got the rubber, you've got the Luffy being able to empty his head. I think we got to do our MVPs or favorite characters and then wrap up. Robin is number one. Fair enough. Robin kills it this this section. Robin's great. Yeah, I was thinking that a lot of people might have some mm, back and forth on Robin, but A... The fight is the fights for Robin are sweet and numerous, like may I point out, but also she's someone who manages to find the lost city. The gods themselves, the first god, didn't even know that it was there. And when he saw it, he was like, what is this? Wiper didn't know it was there. He was like, is this our home place? So come on, Robin. Number two is harder. I'm putting my three. No. 
Number two, I'm going to give to Zorro. His fights are probably the most impressive. And number five is a tie with my two Skypea residents. The order you do these in, I can never see coming. Then number, did I do number three? Yeah. No, I didn't. You didn't. You haven't done three or four. You know, my order is wild. There was a time that you just missed number four. I think the most recent episode, there just wasn't a number four. <laughs> there just wasn't one? <laughs> no. Um, you know what? High five to me. Chaos is the way that you beat random gods. Um, <laughs> okay, well, in that case, I'm going to do number four first. Okay. I'm going to say that number four is... Oh, that's hard. I didn't think it was going to be this hard. You know what? It's Nami. It's Nami. (gasps) She did a lot. Yeah. No, this is a big... Everyone kind of did a lot in this zone. Yeah, this is exactly what the problem is. And then I am going to give Wiper number three. Fair enough. But then there's no Asa and there's no... Okay, you know what? At some point, you just got to say honorable mentions go to every single person in this arc. And you know who I really wanted to put in there, too, is Nora. Why? I I love that snake. I'm so sad. It's if me. that snake is dead, I swear to God. Thank you, everybody, for being here. This was we were a little bit off topic today for a lot of it, but I honestly had so much fun. I don't care. It was great. I said earlier that I would sacrifice anything in the name of fun. And that's my that's the goal of the stream. So I'm glad that we stayed true to the virtues today and just did whatever. Yeah, and I said earlier that my brain felt smooth today. So I'm really glad that we got to have so much fun and it was a little more interactive. Yeah, that was such a blast. I I love hanging out with you guys. I love talking about this. I'm so grateful about the community we built because, like I said earlier, when you start doing these things, you don't know what kind of community you're going to get. And the internet can be the best of us but the and the worst of us and i feel like we only got the best everyone's been incredible our mod team that's been volunteering have been phenomenal all of the audience have been just so great i'm so grateful for all of you i just wanted to give you a heads up i have ordered two more full port ports <laughs> um, so when we come back, um, for people who are on Twitch for our next stream, I'm going to be showing you that I'm making little books under the things that are um, bigger concepts, like the one piece or like the three pillars and putting little information behind them. I can't tell you how much fun that I have here. Um, I never thought that I would have a community in my life based around one piece. And I got to tell you, it was something I didn't know I was missing that has Aww. brought me a lot of fulfillment. I gotta be honest, I hoped I would one day have a community in my life based around One Piece, and you guys go (laughs) so far above and beyond what I could have expected. You are amazing. Okay, it's Skypea. All of Skypea and all of the cork boarding for the entire Skypea for next one. So cool. Thank you guys for being here. Have a good one, everybody. And until next time, it's been lovely talking to you. That was so much fun. That was so fucking long. It's going to be a hell of an editing job.